And I will say manahu to all of you, and please answer me in the, the same way. Manahu. This means hello, greetings, and uh, don't forget it now. Manahu. That's a friendly gesture. When you say manahu, this is, you're speaking to your friends. And when the Indian doesn't speak to you, I presume he doesn't even know you. You may even be a tree there as far as he's concerned. So when an Indian says manahu to you, you say manahu with a smile. Uh, this morning I'm going to, I should stand here. Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Um, this morning I'm going to uh, tell you briefly about uh, Oakhurst and uh, the different tribes that were here. And when I mean a tribe, this, the way the in, this is, I'm telling it the way the Indians tell it, not the way that it is in your books and so forth. The Indians separated uh, themselves like the Irish and the Scotch. They separated uh, their people by their tongue, by their language. In other words, uh, which they call the white people, excuse me, I, the, um, well, all right, the white people came in and they called us monos. We belong to the Paiute tribe. We came from over the mountains. In, in other words, on the eastern slopes of the Sierra. And we migrated into here. And this uh, land over in this area belonged to the, uh, the people that spoke the tongue of the Chukchanches and the, uh, which they call Miwoks now. We call Kusotmo, or the Miwoks, which their tongue ranges from uh, uh, from Awani, uh, and this area of the foothills, all the way up north, clear up into Siskiyou County. I have met Indians that speak the same language. Now this is the way we dis uh, we distinguish the Indians, and uh, the uh, Chukchanches, they speak the same tongue. There's a little variation, but. They can understand the people all the way down into Porterville and these lower lands. Now, I know that they, uh, the, uh, your history and all, they have come in and from different things that the Indians do, and we do things a little different. So they have all these other names which they have attached to. I see some new names down in Bakersfield. They're calling some Menachees. As far as we're concerned, and the way the, the old Indians are, they are still the Wa, which is, they speak this one language, which is the same. The, uh, the Chukchanchi Indians in Corsco can understand the Indians all the way down in the lower foothills. And uh, if you knew how to speak Indian, you would agree with me, but right now you probably won't. And... Uh, the same way that uh, our group of Indians, which they call the Mono, who, was, who came over from the eastern slopes of the uh, Sierra Nevadas, which was our native land, and gradually by trading and going to the coast, uh, they would settle in this area. Some would stay on their way back, they would marry someone over here, and so on, just like when uh, the, the white people came into the East Coast, they came out and they settled. And it, it's the same process. So, uh, from the Indians on the other side, as they say, of the Sierra, I can go up into Utah. In fact, I've been up there around Salt Lake. I've been down the Grand Canyon, and I hear a, a lady standing there and telling her child to stay away from the rim. And I turn around and I think, well, gosh, she speaks the same as I do. But I can understand her. She happens to be a Havasupai, which they call, or the Chimuevis. Their baskets are very similar, but you can understand them. They have a few words that are a little different. There's even a, a few little, uh, uh, a different accent 
between the uh, the Auberry Indians and the uh, the North Fork Indians. Uh, my mother was born in Oakhurst. This area on this side of the this river and divide the uh, this mountain here divided the the property or the land that the uh, the Monos occupied. So my mother was born in Oakhurst, right up, right over here by this, um, where uh, Judge Peckinpah's old house is, below the uh, service station, right in that area. There's a big pounding rock in there. I remember my mother bringing us over there and showing us. Beg your pardon? Y yes. Sir. Mm -hmm. Those were those were used, and they they left their grinding rocks, and they left them uh, uh, the oh the rock that what would that be called that went into the hole pestle yes they left that there they they hid them they hid them and so that when they came back through again they would have it. It took many, many days to make those uh, holes in those rocks. I remember at home, uh, I was born in North Fork, and my mother made a hole for a dog dish for our dog. And it took her a long time using a hard granite rock. She would keep pounding and wearing this out and taking a little Indian broom and sweeping it out. Finally, she had a real nice dish for our, our dog. And all you had to do was throw some water in it, scrub it out. It was permanent. He couldn't carry it away. Did you live the Indian way then when you were a little girl? No, no. hardly. But uh, do you know well, when I when well when when I was a little girl, um, I saw two wigwams. There were two two wigwams. There, uh, one was over by. Uh, an old lady had one over by um, Manzanita Lake, and we loved to go in this this teepee. And uh, then uh, there, I saw one up by the mission. In, you know where the Mich Indian mission is up by North Fork. There's a small reservation there now, and uh, I remember one there. But they were made of bark, cedar bark. The outside to shed the water, and uh, they were enclosed where uh, there were no drafts in them at all. They were right on the ground, and uh, it was fun to go in there. <laughs> uh, and they cooked on a small fire, but they were very warm, and uh, they didn't catch cold or anything. The Indians didn't ca seem to catch the colds until the uh, white people began to want them to live in homes. Well, the homes were not insulated like they are now, and uh, so they caught cold. Many of them died from uh, colds. Of course, disease was brought in at that, in that way. But um, I was going to t briefly tell you how uh, the main food of the Indians at that time, and let's see, my mother, I guess, would have been about uh, 95 if she were living now and um, uh, they they lived over here until uh, four men drove up on their horses and uh, told them that that was their land and to leave so they burned their wigwam they lived in wigwams and they went on over near where I live now and settled there but th those things happen when someone takes over but they, to tell you about the, this was told to me by my uh, great aunt, who lived to be 104. Maybe she ate a lot of acorn, but uh, many of the Indians lived very, uh, very long time. They, their diet was uh, 
which acorn is, I imagine, probably classed as a nut. This, it has a lot of uh, oil in it, you know. What, what exactly you know, do they do with it? Just eat it as a vegetable? No, it's the, it was their main dish. It was like uh, poi is to the Hawaiians. Yes, and it was used to eat with meat, with their greens. They ate a lot of greens, a lot of raw, uh, you know, greens, onions and clover. There are certain types of lupin. There are just many, many things that they ate. And, uh, but this was their main dish and fish and, uh, and uh, meat of all kinds. But in the, she, I asked her one time, what did you do before the uh, Spaniards were the first ones that came into them. They, they were the first. She was telling me that uh, her grandmother told her that they were down on the San Joaquin River getting roots to make baskets, and these soldiers drove up. And she said, um, uh, oh, there were two huge oak trees and their guns circled, both of the oak trees stood up side by side. So I, I don't know how many there were in this group of soldiers that came in. And they, uh, they brought, and they, they, were, they, were, uh, they were not white like some of the white men they had seen. So uh, in later years, we'd, we, um, uh, found out that they were the Spaniards that came from the from the missions, you know, from the coast, and uh, so they offered them flour. And they showed them how to make tortillas. See, our Indians never had flour, and uh, they offered them. And the Indians, they said, "Oh, these people want to poison us," and they they dumped the flour on the ground, and. Uh, a couple of the ladies, they took it and they, they watched how they made the, mixed it with water and made the tortilla and, you know, they baked it on a rock. They showed these, the Spaniards showed them how. <laughs> and uh, um, after they left, and she said, they said they were very kind to them. They didn't harm them. They were frightened. Most of them ran off and hid. But the ones that stayed there, they said they were they were kind to them. They didn't chase them or anything. So, uh, and after they had left, that some of the Indians that had dumped it on the ground and they had seen and tasted very carefully, but it tastes like they were trying to scoop this flour up and, and use it. And that was the beginning of when they started using flour. So they, and of course they started coming in. But in the, I was going to tell you the ancient Indians. Before they had claws of any kind, they made a mound uh, on the, near the uh, um, stream or by a spring. They usually made it into a pyramid shape. And uh, then they leveled it all off. They take this soft dirt or sand and make a, a, a pointed peak about that big. Then they leveled it off very carefully, and they took clean, real clean sand, sort of coarse, about the size of um, a half a pea, or maybe a quarter of a pea. And they spread this on the, on the, all over the bottom. And after they had washed it, they put it in a basket that had a lot of holes in it, and they washed this in the water shaking around and they spread this all over oh they said about two or three inches and then they took this flour i have i brought just a little of this this has been is the acorn that you see on the tree in the fall it has been dried and parched it's out in the sun so it gets real dry and hard and then they peel they, uh, after they've cracked it, of course, then they peel off the outer skin. There's a little membrane on there like you find on peanuts. It looks red. You have to take that off. Or that's very bitter. And then they uh, uh, 
After that, it's all taken off. Then they pound it in those holes that you see. And there are usually, in a row, you find maybe six, six holes. And even over there, there might be uh, six or eight more different areas, but they'll be along together. And maybe there would be uh, 15 or 20 women in this village, or this, they camp sort of together. The families did, big families. They would take a day and go and, and the lady, you'll find a real deep hole. If you look at your rocks, you that have these uh, rocks around your places, and there's a very deep hole, and there's also a rock that fits in there, if you could ever find it. Mo they have, most of them have been dug up and carried away in people's yards. But this large one will fit right in there. So that's where you put the acorn when it's first shell, and it's that big. <coughs> Why? Why would they do that? Well, if you put it in the shallow one, when you hit it with this rock, it would just pop out. So they put it in the deep one, and it held the acorn there. And they would pound it. It wouldn't jump out of the pothole. Then, then they, that lady would break them up into uh, about uh, pea size. She'd dig it out, and she'd put it in the net for the lady for the next hole. She would take it down finer until it went through about five processes until it was just like this. This is just as fine as flour. The last lady would uh, uh, take, uh, and she would sift this very carefully with a basket. And this now is ready to be leached. And this is when they put it, took this fine powder, and they put it on this clean sand. On, on this and this mound that they have made and then they take and they warm water they have to warm water all right the Indians had no no utensils like we have today they couldn't take and set a pot on top of the fire and heat it could they because they had no metal nothing made out of metal what do you suppose they did how do you suppose any of you heard how did they do it they didn't know. You know? No. They they um they heated rocks. What kind of rocks? I don't know. This is very important. They use soapstone. When you when you put soapstone in the in the fire, when you put soap soapstone in the fire, it will not explode. Have you ever seen a rock explode? Oh, it's dangerous. Don't ever put uh, uh, in a hot fire. Don't ever put rocks in there because you don't know which ones. They all contain a certain amount of water and they'll just explode and just hurt you. Anyway, they, they heated their rocks, their soapstone rocks, and they took they had a they had large baskets they made large baskets in those days and they would have that full of cold water and then uh, they would take this um, um, two two sticks they were very good at picking them up they'd pick up these two hot I um, mean with these two sticks they'd pick up this rock and they swish it through us in, a, in a, another pot here another basket I, I beg your pardon another basket that had some water in it. They swish it quickly to wash the ashes off. They put it in this large basket, and then they had this... How many of you ever seen these Indian spoons? It's, it's made out of a piece of oak and twisted around. That is what they, they kept moving this rock around, and it usually took about one or two rocks for about, oh, five gallons that, in this big basket. And they would do this about four times, heat that about four different times. As soon as they, that was lukewarm, they t took another basket, a small basket, and they would start to pour this on, on this, this acorn, which had been spread all out on this sand. And in order that 
if you just poured the water, like you take, you just pour water on something, it makes a hole in there, doesn't it? You know, like you pour it in soft sand, it makes a hole, and it kind of, well, it'll just make a hole in there, and we'll dig down to the sand. So they took, and they like to use um, fir branches if they could get them. If they couldn't get fir branches, they would get fern. Use the fern branches and make sort of a bouquet. They'd lie it down on top of the meal, on top of this meal. They'd pour the water over that, and it would just disperse it. It'd be like a spreader. How many of you have one of those coffee makers that are Mr. Coffee, and it has a spreader, they call a spreader, and that water hits on there and it spreads over that coffee and makes it filter through? It's the same method. And uh, maybe that's where the white man learned that. We don't know. Maybe they learned that. You suppose the Indians taught the white men anything? And uh, this would, they would put about four large baskets of this lukewarm water. Each time they would have to heat it uh, by, with these rocks. Then they'd pour it on there and let it seep through. Now this took all the bitter out of this. This is very bitter right now if you would taste it. It's very bitter. It, would, it took all the bitterness out of the, the meal. And then when they were all through, they would scrape off the top with their hand like this. But they were very careful. It was it's sort of an art to get down there and not take a rock with it. They just take it off like that. And they put it in the in a basket, another basket. Big no basket about that big. The kind of baskets that hold the water. And they set that aside. Now they didn't want to waste any of their their um, their good acorn that they had worked hard on because it would be quite a bit on this on these rocks these nice clean rocks they had washed all the fine sand off all the dust off so they would take and if you take and press your hand on something like that like you pick it up and it'll, it'll, it would pick up just enough rocks and they would put it in the basket in this basket and they pour some water on it now when you take and you have uh, something heavy, it goes to the bottom, doesn't it? If you shook a, a, a pan uh, like this, the rocks would stay in the bottom. Or like when you mine gold. Have you ever mined gold? When you mine gold and you wash and wash, the gold is so heavy it goes to the bottom. And it stays in the bottom. That's how you get your gold. The same way with the rocks. They would go to the bottom of this... this um, a basket so they would pour that off very carefully pour it off maybe they'd put some more on and wash it again and then all the good acorn would go off with the water and left the rocks in the bottom of the the bath the basket then they were all through so they didn't waste any of their acorn now this is the way the Indians did it way before the white men ever brought any cloths in they didn't use they didn't use, uh, oh, they say they used this and that. Maybe some other tribes had other methods. I know up, I have heard and read and talked with some of the Indians up in the northern part of the state. Of course, these Indians say, oh, they were lazy. <laughs> so what would they do? They were busy fishing and they'd put their acorn, uh, this was in later years when they had a cloth, and they tie a rope on it and throw it out in the river, and leave it there for a couple of days, and then the water would wash all the bitter out just in that sack. Which that sounds pretty easy. I think I'd like that because I like to go fishing. You know that would suit me fine. But um, this was the old method, and I'm trying to tell you what happened years ago. And then, of course, after they were had this all uh, leached out, and it was. Uh, it tastes good. It had um, a sort of a, a nutty flavor to it. Then they took some more hot rocks and they mixed this, uh, the acorn up now. You see, we have some water in it now, this that we have. They mixed this all up and they uh, took the hot rocks now. And it took many hot rocks. And they had this liquid, which was the, the leech flour. 
and uh, like if you were going to make gravy. Your mother ever make gravy or uh, make a sauce? And you take uh, flour or cornstarch and mix it up and uh, put it on the uh, stove. And as it gets warm, you stir it till it gets thick. Do you remember any, any of you girls have seen your mother do that? Um, when you... Um, uh, and so anyway, when the, when the ladies... Um, may I have your attention now? I'm going to tell you and, I, and then I'm going to run home. And as soon as you, uh, I'll wait a second, it's all right, it's all right. But, uh, and as soon as uh, the acorn was done, it, as I say, sometimes it took about 10 rocks, depending on how, how much they were going to cook. And they'd take those two sticks and they'd do like this in this water and wash the ashes off, put it in there. They take this wooden stick and stir it around. And pretty soon that would start to boil. You could just see it bubble up like this. And one thing that I used to like when my great aunt fixed acorn like that, she would take these rocks that had been used and she'd set them over on a nice big clean rock over here. And as it sat there, it would cook the the acorn until it was real crispy. It was sort of like potato chips. And, and then it would bubble off a little bit and we loved to take and pick it off and eat it. It, it, it was, had a real nutty flavor. We just loved it. And um, after it was all done, they would either, they could either eat it, some people liked it hot and they would have some, um, deer meat or some um, nice trout and they would and some other ladies would be over here uh, broiling that on the coals they put it right on the coals too they never put it over any just lay it right on the coal they blow the coals lay it on there blow it again <laughs> anyway that was quite a treat for us when we uh, when we were young and this is very hard to get a hold of now I imagine this was ground in a uh, electric grinder, this acorn here that I have. It cost now, the Indians sell it for about $15 a pound. <laughs> so you can see how uh, few people are left that even know, and I would like to have you remember what I have told you. There are so many uh, young people now that are Indians too that uh, have never had the advantage of having every, anyone tell them anything. Now, they asked me if I lived in a wigwam. No, um, I lived in a house just like everybody else. My father was a carpenter. My father was not Indian. My mother was full-blooded Indian. And uh, we lived like anyone else. And we didn't have too much acorn to eat unless we went visiting. My father didn't care for that sort of a diet, so there isn't too much. But I'm so happy that I uh, learned all these things. For some reason in those days, when we went to school, I went to school with the Indian children in North Fork, and they wouldn't let us speak Indian. We, oh, that's fun to talk another language, especially one that, that everyone else can talk. So, but that didn't stop us, you know. But you were punished if you if you talked Indian. They were so eager to make us be like them, I guess, you know. And I never wanted to be that uh, that way. And I don't think any of the rest of the Indian children did. But we did learn how to speak English and live like we're supposed to, I suppose. <laughs> but uh, I, I think, it, it, are there any questions about, this was the main thing I wanted to tell you about was the acorn. Uh, yes, sir. Billy, are the black oak the only oak that the acorn? No, the black oak is the best. Black oak gels the best. Then the white oak. Now I know the Forest Service calls the white oak we call the, uh, that long 
and it has a little darker bark we call the water oak. The Indians call it, I don't know, the old time white people called the water oak. The Indians call it the oak with the water because that one doesn't gel at all. And when there weren't very many acorns, they would, they would take, pick that one and mix it. It would just take the place of water, yet it would make some bulk. 